episode 315. What's next is the ability for the motorist to actually just click on or tap on a smartphone and select the brand of the part that he or she wants to have installed on his vehicle at the place where he wants to have the vehicle serviced. That technology, by the way, is already here. Welcome, aftermarketers, to Remarkable Results Radio. Listen to learn just one thing from today's episode on your journey to remarkable results. Welcome, aftermarketers, throughout North America and around the world to episode 315 with Chris Gardner. Carm Capriato here, and so glad you've chosen Remarkable Results for the best aftermarket talk radio that surely makes your commute more enjoyable. Why listen to the news when you can gain insights from your aftermarket colleagues? Talk about upping the ante. This episode is brought to you by Federal Mogul Motor Parts and Garage Gurus. Search for parts, get the latest technical updates, and sign up for the Garage Rewards Loyalty Program for techs and shops at fmmotorparts.com. There's nothing like scoring some free swag. As a loyal podcast listener, I want to thank you for making the podcast a part of your learning strategy. The personal nature of podcasts delivers a one-on-one experience for you. Each interview and Town Hall Academy provides insights from your industry colleagues who are willing to share their best practices and ideas so that we learn from each other. The educational value of Remarkable Results Radio is priceless. I can only hope that you find the inspiration to help you on your own remarkable pathway. Welcome new Facebook friends of the podcast, Mike DeSantis, Dan Guy, Mick Bradbury, Cyrus NK, and Ryan Doyle. And new LinkedIn connections, Phil Carpenter, Gregory Sampson, and Marley Carter. Thanks for every social connection you've made to the podcast. I have a convenient page with every social link at remarkableresults.biz slash social. By the way, there's some great business coach interviews waiting for your listen. Go to RemarkableResults.biz and click on the Business Coaches series. This episode's show notes resides at RemarkableResults.biz slash E315. Now meet Chris Gardner, MAAP, the Vice President of Programs and Member Services for AASA, the Automotive Aftermarket Suppliers Association. AASA is the voice for the aftermarket supplier industry. Chris also manages all things technology for the association, and that is where we spend the majority of our time in this interview. A highlight is Chris's talk about the Consumer Electronics Show, CES, becoming more automotive than ever. He'll give you a perspective on what he saw and the impact as he sees it on the aftermarket as our future rolls out. We talk about the aftermarket's role with all new technology as it relates to the availability of parts. We talk Apex as AASA is the co-owner with the Auto Care Association in Apex and the focus on technology as a big part of Apex going forward. Among other discussion topics like ATIS and the tech he saw at CES, Chris sees a convergence of telematics with the consumer, the service professional, and the supplier. Now get your thinking cap on with some future talk with Chris Gardner from AASA. Hey, a warm welcome to Chris Gardner, MAAP, the Vice President of Programs and Member Services for AASA. That's the Automotive Aftermarket Suppliers Association. Hey, Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks, Carm. It's it's great to be here with you, and I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I'm thrilled to have you here. I know we've been working on this for a while. You are involved in all things technology for AASA. Yeah, I am. Uh, I've I've got uh, three broad roles. One is uh, um, I manage internal staff operations here at AASA, but then I also manage some things that have to do with members directly. One is my team helps manage Apex, and we also manage intellectual property efforts. But then a good bit of my time is spent on all things technology. I love the idea that you're involved in Apex, and not, I'm not sure everyone knows this, but AutoCare and AASA are co-owners, I believe, of Apex, right? Correct. That's exactly right. Have been for many years. I'd love to. I just, and we're not going to do this today, but I'd love to know how busy you are at the show, how many months you have to prepare. I'm sure you're preparing for it right now. 
we've been preparing for the 2018 show for probably about a year now already. Okay. All right. So it's not a 12 month process. It's more like a 16 to 18 month process. Got it. Yeah. You're, you're overlapping and you know, you're doing your, uh, what, what works, what doesn't. And you're always staying ahead of the curve. And I, I know last year you guys did some really great technology things there. I'm, I'm sure that was, um, something you wanted to see happen. I mean, it was a joint effort with uh, a lot of different people involved, but really did want to see Apex up its technology game. And I think it needs to, to, be re- to remain relevant and to provide value to both the exhibitors and the attendees. And so we had a brand new mobility park outside with demonstrations that showed a few things technology-wise. And then we had um, inside, we had a technology intersection, which was focused on technologies that aren't even available in production. They're three to five years out. And so that really challenged attendees to think about, you know, how is this going to change my business? And that was the point of it was try to challenge them to think about that. I love what you say. And I'm kind of a person like that. I, I love to if you will, lean over my skis and and see what's <laughs> out there and, and, and learn about that stuff. Even though I'm a person who says I may not be affected by it personally now, maybe even in the next five years, but I want to know, I just want to know what's what's going on out there. And anything we can do as an industry to point that direction, you know, high fives and kudos to you guys. Well, it's not easy. It's a challenge because while we'd like to know what's going to happen in five years, we really don't know exactly. We just follow where the trends are taking us. Yeah, you know, and I understand that if you look at something, you say it could could be, should be, would it be, but at least it gets you an idea of what some of the deep thinkers in our industry are doing. Yeah, exactly. As a matter of fact, it's interesting that I've heard uh, – Charlie Johnson, one of our key members, uh, um, say more more than one occasion, you know, really all you can do is plan for so far and then go to that point. And when you get there, then you might be able to see a little bit further from there. Great quote. I love that quote. So you and I were chatting on the phone and you said, this was before, uh, I think it was late last year. And you said, you know, I'm going to CES, the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. And I said, when you come back, could you tell us what you saw? And you know more than I do because I'm only hearing about it. But people were telling me, Carm, it seems like every car manufacturer is at CES and it's turning to be an automotive electronics show. Is that true? Well, partially true, Carm. Um, for sure, automotive has has garnered a significant amount of hype. I mean, it it's just amazing how much hype there is around um, connected cars and self-driving cars. And the one big thing, uh, one thing that was big this year was uh, connected cities. Not every automaker is at CES. There are a handful of them for sure. And not every supplier is at CES, but there are several dozen that are there. But they're really the ones who are creating a lot of hype around some of these connected technologies and self-driving cars, et cetera. Um, it's, it's interesting that the car companies and the technology providers to the automotive industry have gravitated to CES away, not necessarily away from, but in addition to the International Car Show in Detroit, the SAE show, and so forth. Um, But the primary reason, I think, is because CES is not a buying and selling show. It is a hype show. You go there not to place orders for next year's you know, product line. You don't go there to sell specific products. You go there so you can get coverage by the media or get social media coverage and exposure. That it's a hype show. It's, it's glamour, glitz. It's kind of like SEMA. Well, SEMA's sort of in between. SEMA, there's still a lot of buyers that are placing orders for products for next year, just like Apex. Got it. Yeah. Um, but but for sure, SEMA like uh, like CES has taken it to a new level. And it, it, there's significant TV, social media, online, video, and even print magazine coverage and podcasts, et cetera. There, there is. Every, everything's going on there. It's amazing. The, the week before, the week during, and the week after, you can't go anywhere in any magazine, in any TV show, in any sound snippet and not get something from CES. So take us there. Describe to the audience what CES is like. 
that's a good question because if you haven't been there to experience it, it really is hard to appreciate it. Um, even with all that coverage that you mentioned um, that you see everywhere. Uh, first thing I'd like to say is CES is the largest trade annual trade show. It is a trade show. A lot of people don't understand this, but it is a B2B trade show that is consumers by and large cannot get into the show. You have to be a buyer, a seller, a developer or whatever. It's, it's the largest trade show in North America. But it's really not that much larger than the Apex SEMA combined show. So we have about 163,000 that come to our annual industry show. There's about 180 or 83 or so thousand for the CES. So it's not that much larger than, than, than our show. Um, but there's significantly more media and other types of people who are there. So the show itself is located in several venues, the Las Vegas Convention Center, Sands Expo Center, the Venetians ballrooms, and even hotels and uh, convention space at City Center. Uh, it's really all over the place. Um, and the one thing that's significant about CS is that they do a pretty good job of categorizing. So there are multiple technology areas, and it's almost they they've almost created a never-ending recurring business revenue because any new technology that comes out, and we know this is not, not going to end, we're always going to have new technologies, they'll create a home for it. So there's education, there's uh, uh, fitness. So you're saying it's almost like it's categorized. Every, almost everything can be is placed in a section or a category, got yes. It, it. So there's home security, there's uh, audio, There, of course there's automotive, uh, there's 3D printing. Uh, there's a section for drones. It just goes on and on. And there's even one for HMI, human machine interface. There's one for uh, computer chips and semiconductors, a whole section just for that. So any new technology that comes along, they'll probably find a home for it there. Well, wow. take us to the automotive section. Well, the automotive section um, is definitely interesting. There are um, just a multiple numbers of different applications that we'll find there. Some of the, the broader ones are um, come from the OEMs, but also from a lot of suppliers there. Um, so I already mentioned smart cities. So several exhibitors this year had exhibits on smart cities and what that means in the future about connected cars and autonomous vehicles. Um, there are self-driving vehicles at CES. You can actually take a drive in a self-driving vehicle but it's really interesting that a lot of the exhibitors that have this technology and this experience, it's by appointment only. So not only do you have to be in the industry of some type to go to the show, uh, you have to have an appointment just to get in and experience some of these technologies. Uh, there's virtual uh, dashboards and controls, virtual heads-up displays, tons of information on predictive analytics and vehicle data. Uh, Carm, there was one that I found fascinating. Nissan had demonstrated a brain sensing technology that is designed to anticipate what reactions drivers will have in certain emergency situations and then help the driver avoid the actual problem itself. I read about that, Chris. Oh, my God. I mean, I was like a little kid in a toy store reading through this article. <laughs> and, you know, they were saying that so many milliseconds before you were going to make that move yourself that uh, the vehicle would do that. And they showed this device that you would wear on your head, and uh, it was pretty damn Star Wars yeah, I'll tell you that. Yeah, it was. And they, the, what they demonstrated was uh, an individual with the uh, sensors and the little cap thing on his head. And you could see the animated um, course that he was driving, but you could also see the brain waves that it was detecting and the types of signals the brain was giving off. So you could tell when he was agitated or in getting ready for to have to emergency break or whatever. Now, this is not production technology, which is typical of a lot of CES exhibitors and products. They're not production in a lot of cases. But they're demonstrating how they can detect these the brain waves and what the brain was thinking and doing to be able – and they showed on the screen exactly what would happen when, let's say, something ran out in front of the, in front of the driver. And so it was – and the whole goal was to try to understand – and anticipate, you know, what the driver was going to have to do in an emergency situation. So it's not for production yet, but you can tell where they're trying to 
trying to go. Okay, so you you saw that? Did you see that actually yourself? Did you you know kind of? Yeah, I saw it. I didn't actually go in and participate, but I, but I watched the gentleman doing the drive. You, you saw it, and out of many of the things that you saw, Chris, do you believe this is something that literally could happen to us? I mean, we're gonna possibly get in our vehicles, and if it's not going to be an autonomous car, but we want help, we want to make this car. Autonomous and me, <laughs> right? Autonomous and me. Uh, you think something like that's really going to uh, go mainstream in, say, 10 years? Well, I'm, I'm glad you threw in the qualifier because if you hadn't thrown in the qualifier, I would have to guess. In 10 years, I don't think that's going to be something that's production or mainstream. But I will say the technology for these types of things, for completely autonomous vehicles, that technology is already here. That's that's not the issue. The issue is is how comfortable drivers are in, in a relinquishing control of the car. And when will the uh, different states and municipalities and the government get together and figure out how the infrastructure works from state to state, city to city, because a vehicle can't work one way in one city and then you drive a to another city or another state and have a different way of the car sensing and detecting and reflecting and reacting, that just won't work. So the whole country's got to get together on this thing. That's no easy task. Well, what an interesting thought you just put through my mind. Uh, Listen, uh, I'm going to have to drive to Pittsburgh. Oh, I can't because my car doesn't work in Pennsylvania. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Interesting challenge. Yeah, we have to figure that out first, don't we? Yes. Well, we do. Yeah, so like I said, technology is here for a car to drive itself. That that exists. I'm talking with Jonathan Jacelli, a technical product specialist with Federal Mogul Motor Parts. So Jonathan, how does a service professional get the guru on the go van to their shop? There's a couple ways. We do what we call cold calls where we go around and just visit shops based on uh, geographics. And there's also times where we team up with outside sales reps from other parts distributors and visit the shops on that basis. So I love this. You pull into a shop on a cold call, they see the van, and they're probably excited to see you. Yeah. I've had a couple shops where they've actually have already heard of the gurus via Facebook or social media. So when I show up, they've already been signed up and taken online classes. And now that the van's there, it's really easy to book a lunch and learn. So you're really an extension of the Garage Guru Training Centers. Yes, absolutely. So you're all done with your lunch and learn. You spend 45 minutes to an hour. Probably that's all you can really get from a busy, busy shop. What are the technicians saying about your shop visit? Oh, they love it. They thank me, you know, every second I'm walking out the door and just can't wait for me to come back again. Federal Mogul Motor Parks' Garage Gurus is your go-to source for the vehicle training, technology, and answers you need to keep your next job on track. On site, online, or on demand, the gurus are here to help keep your business and your career on the road to success. Visit fmgarageguru.com. The the idea of this Nissan technology just goes to show all of us that are participating in this industry that there's so many exciting things on the horizon. And I guess the message has been and always has been with aggressive aftermarket visionaries is don't be afraid of this stuff embrace it it's not going to crush or kill you because look at where the technology and the automobile has come over all these years capitalism and and sheer will of people will figure out how to make it work and how to fix it and how to embrace it and we always will we always will figure those things out it's kind of um, to jump back to the aftermarket all this connected technology so many people perceive as a threat and it's going to kill the aftermarket because cars will, they will fix themselves. We, we already have what is called self-healing technology, over-the-air software, downloads, and all these things. The aftermarket has always been able to figure these things out and service vehicles and get to the data and all of this. So in a broader sense, the country, the industry, the technology providers, even the drivers, you know what? We'll figure it out. I love what you just said. I wrote down the words because every time I interview someone, I'm, I'm, I'm writing these thoughts that pop through my mind. And I wrote down, we will become a player. And we've always been a player. 
And if it wasn't for associations like Auto Care and AASA and the countless other great associations that are, you know, supporting their membership, looking out for us, we may be so fragmented, we may be worried about that. But I think that's one of the great things about having associations and you at your level looking out for that kind of stuff and knocking on the heads of your members saying, guys, <laughs> guys. We've got to be players here. So you're you're out there. You're at CES. Do you see any aftermarket applications uh, besides uh, that uh, that we're going to be able to play in this technology someday that that could land in our lap? There are a few, and it's growing it, every year. I've been three years in a row, and it has grown each year. Some are applicable today. Some are still being developed. Will be applicable in the future. Uh, examples are uh, telematics and plug-in devices. Uh, and uh, vehicle data platforms. So that's one that, that exists. It's already in use. Um, I, I would could sit here and tell you a few of the exhibitors, but that would upset some others, so I don't want to do that. <laughs> that's definitely in, uh, on exhibit at CES. ADOS uh, is very much so. There, there are several exhibitors that have backup cameras and dash cams, smart mirrors, sensors on license plate frames, lane change warning systems, remote starting and keyless entry systems, and all this for, for, you know, for existing car, cars in the car park, so aftermarket applications. I have a five-year-old car. I want to make it uh, more like a, an advanced driver assist system, ATIS. I could go out and buy that in the aftermarket. Now, my question, and I'm not sure you know the answer to this, this thing... They they stand on their own. They they don't all hook. They don't hook into the car's computer, do they? Some of both. There are some that are standalone, where you literally just uh, put a camera, in the back of your car somewhere, and then connect it to uh, a mirror or a or a monitor that you would put on your mirror or instead of your in place of your mirror or whatever, and that could be standalone. But there are also ones that would connect with the car's computer network as well. Obviously, those are more expensive. And the price point of these uh, have has a direct impact on the, the take-up or the adoption rate. You would recommend that automotive aftermarket executives and professionals go to CES, wouldn't you? It's a question I ask our members and have been for the last three or four years is who inside your company is researching, investigating, thinking about communicating with the other employees and other executives about and strategizing on these disruptive technologies, who is doing that? And a few of our members are doing it. A growing number of them have identified people within their companies who are doing it. That's going to increase. It's interesting um, that you, that you raised that point because we saw, a couple of executives from a, a major retailer in the automotive aftermarket space, I won't name who it is or who it was, who was coming from one of our members' booths. I'll, I'll tell you the name. It was, it was Mon and Hummel, and they had a filter system with about 10 sensors embedded in it. And they were measuring the pressure differential before and after the filter so that they could monitor the when the, uh, the life cycle of the filter was going to come to an end when they needed to monitor it. When it got to 80 or 90%, it's still good, but maybe 93% drop in pressure or increase in pressure or whatever was going to cause someone to replace the filter. Well, these executives, they, this company, this retailer recognized they need to be at CES to, to, to find out what's going on out there. And so they were visiting these booths to see how uh, automotive parts are changing. I, I, I'd like to quote Tom Landry and say, if I had to pick my greatest strength as a football coach, um, I'd say it would be innovation. So of all the things Tom Landry did well, he thought he was an innovator is what made him most successful. I think uh, successful automotive aftermarket companies in the future will be those that have innovation and are part of the disruption instead of being disrupted by some third party or outside company or outside industry. So it's imperative that now, can you say that a bearing is going to have a sensor put on it or a seal or hoses or belts, a sensor put on there so you can monitor things? Well, I know for a fact that several of our members are already doing that. They're already working on this. They're already putting sensors on these parts. So if you're a company out there and is not looking into this yet, you're not going to a CES or we have some of this technology at Apex as well and you're not thinking about these things, then you're probably falling behind. 
all the more reason to get yourself to um, a, a big show like Apex. Yep, for sure. Absolutely. And, uh, and all the major trade shows like that are um, seeing an increase in the number of exhibitors who have these advanced technologies. The, the difference really in CES and Apex and SEMA is that you see much more of pr- production oriented or products that are either out or coming out next year at, at our industry shows, where at CES, a significant portion or percentage of the products uh, won't be out for three to five years or maybe concept and may not ever be in production. Got it. So the reason it seems to me that you go to CES is because you're really trying to help AASA's plan for addressing emerging technologies. Yeah, it, it really is um, because um, it's not that we know our members' business better than they do. It's just so many, so many uh, executives and managers within our member companies are so busy with the business at hand it's really difficult to scout out every venue out there and learn about every technology that's out there. So it's part of the service we provide is that we do this on behalf of our members. We have different conversations with the suppliers. We also talk to them about, you know, how do they partner with technology companies? That's a big challenge is should our members, the manufacturers, develop this technology internally or organically? Should they acquire it? Should they partner with someone or should they just watch out for the the startups and the venture capital backed companies to try to find one when it eventually becomes viable and production ready and then go partner with them or whatever. This is, this is new to a lot of our members. And so the, a lot of what we do is we, we engage in these conversations to help lead them, lead them down that path. I would love to be the fly on a wall in one of your members strategic planning meetings as they look to the future and <laughs> attempt, like you just said, to figure out, are they in, are they out, or are they on the sidelines, or, or what, what? Very refreshing ideas, Chris. Thank you so much. Are there any obvious implications for the repair community that you see in all of the um, tech that's going on, and especially what you saw at CES? I think number one is a concern for the independent repair shop, Carm, and that is the new cars that have ADOS um, embedded in them and connectivity embedded in them, whether it's embedded connectivity or even a plug-in device, these vehicles have got to be serviced. And there are special, unique requirements for servicing these vehicles. And I, I'll give you a couple of examples. One is um, if you're going to uh, plug into a vehicle and you're going to download data, well, there are new data privacy laws and more and more coming out every year that everybody's got to pay attention to and be aware of. Now, how you handle that data, if it's vehicle history or driver history or vehicle health or diagnostics or what they're listening to on the radio or whatever it is, how do you handle that? And how does the independent shop have the capabilities of protecting that data and, and protecting who has access to it and where it's exposed. That's an, a, a, an area of concern. Another one is servicing ADOS-enabled vehicles. So ADOS is, has a lot of components to it, but some of it has to do with radar and LIDAR, cameras, sensors, all these things that um, have to do with how the car – these are programmed and they're, they're calibrated at the assembly plant based on the car's height, lift, position, where it's on the bumper, where it's on the, the rear bumper, the fender, the license plate, cover, the, the, wherever it's located around on top of the roof, uh, mirrors, all these places. So what happens when a car has been damaged slightly? What happens when someone puts in oversized tires? What happens when uh, someone lifts their car? All these things will change the alignment of some of the radars and liars. Now, What you need is dedicated space at a repair shop to be able to sight the LIDAR and the radar and all these things. And you can't have people walking around. You can't have uh, unusual noises. You can't have even certain patterns of like checkerboard patterns or, or checkered flag patterns. All of that impacts how a car is aligned and is eventually reset and recalibrated for ADOS. 
How many repair shops have thought through this and have those uh, have those capabilities? Well, I'll tell you that they haven't yet, but uh, there is so much talk. I had the luxury in May of 2017 to see a demonstration on ATIS um, calibration from Bosch in Detroit. And I sat there like most of us did with our mouths gaping open as they were putting, you know, the, the targets and measuring everything on as to how to actually get the right calibration together. And we were also told that we were in the wrong place at the wrong time. It wasn't leveled and the light wasn't right for it actually to work, but it was the best spot that they could actually show the equipment. And so, yes, we, we continue to think in, in the service side of the industry that there's going to be either be some specialty shops or there's going to be full bays dedicated to, uh, to ADIS calibration and repair. Thank you so much for bringing that up and, and, and solidifying what I think we currently know. You are obviously the, the supplier side of the industry. And with all these smart parts coming out today... I have just this curiosity is, will our manufacturers start tooling up? Uh, how is the um, the availability of, you know, maybe a password going to happen to get the part to start working? I'm just, just so curious about this. Could you shed any light on that for me? Not a lot because nobody really knows how this is going to pan out. There's so many different aspects to this conversation. One is who owns the right to software on a car, that's yet to be really solidified. The Digital Millennial Copyright Act is something that is reviewed by the federal government every other year, and we speak into that. Our association speaks into that on behalf of our members. Um, That could change in the future. Cybersecurity laws and protections are constantly changing. There really aren't any standards for that for devices that are plugged into a car. So that's something that may have to be done. Um, Over-the-air software downloads is an area of amazing opportunity and potential challenges uh, and threats to the independent aftermarket. So it's really not clear as to who's going to do what as far as managing, uh, who has access, via what types of passwords, and do those passwords have to constantly change that's all in the works, Carm. It's got to be figured out. We, we, everybody knows the federal government, the OEMs, the OE suppliers, the aftermarket suppliers, even the independent uh, repair garages. We all know this has got to be worked out and figured out. Nobody has the answers quite yet. Are cars today having them smart parts on it? I mean, are there are there any showing up? I mean, some of these ADIS uh, parts, they're just not available in the aftermarket. For example, if a, if a radar piece goes down, that's just totally OE, right, right now? Yes and no. It, it's pr- predominantly OE. The, the ADOS is, is fairly new, so there's not been a lot of uh, need for a you know, high volume of parts for replacement purposes. The challenge is that, as I said earlier, one is price point. So, you know, can the, can the independent aftermarket afford to get into the business of replacing these parts. Obviously, with they're going to have to be replaced. Everything breaks and everything has to be replaced at some point. A lot of the, the model, the price points, the supply chain for some of these things, they're still evolving. They have not been figured out yet. I can't imagine it. You know, it's possible that not many in the industry uh, at the at the service side really appreciate what it takes to fill a distribution pipeline with a, a, a special ATIS part. And for a company to stop and think, okay, well, we've got all these warehouse distributors and jobbers, you know, forward-leaning distribution channel. How do we fill it with um, millions of dollars worth of the cost of these special parts? And it does pose a challenge. So we're probably, what, five, six years out figuring that out? We can assign that time span to it if you want to. And that sounds as good as any I've heard, but who knows when we're actually going to figure right, it out. Okay. All right. But all you right. know what's interesting, Carm, is the ADOS, it, it, we we're talking about disruption to our industry or implications was the word that you used. I think another huge one is in the area of the convergence of e-tailing, telematics, accessing vehicle data through telematics, the ability to empower the consumer or the motorist with data about his or her vehicle and uh, catalog information and the ability to serve it or to identify where you want your vehicle serviced, schedule service, pay for service, 
all of that exists now. And I think what's next, it's to me, it's an obvious evolution. What's next is the ability for the motorist to actually just click on or tap on a smartphone and select a brand of the part that he or she wants to have installed on his vehicle at the place where he wants to have the vehicle serviced. That technology, by the way, is already here. What we're seeing is just the beginning of the formation of uh, relationships between companies that will make that happen. So just recently, there was an announcement between a major e-tailer and a major telematics slash dongle slash mobile app provider. Uh, this relationship to me is going to be obvious what they're going to try to do eventually, and that is enable the consumer to be able to order parts. And that's an amazing opportunity for the brands who are part of that system or part of that network. But it could be very uh, challenging for brands that aren't part of that network. All right. But are you telling me, Chris, that if uh, a DTC comes up and uh, some piece of smart code says you could have an oxygen sensor and who knows, again, let's go back to the real world of diagnostics today. It's just a place you know, DTC code says, okay, stadium in the back left corner behind, you know, left field, there's a row and a seat that possibly has your answer in it. I mean, it's just really pointing the direction of a problem that you have. It is not giving you the solution. So you're telling me that someone would encourage someone to order a whatever brand name oxygen sensor and have it shipped in two days to their home? Is that what you're saying? Or the shop they want to get it repaired at? Well, sure. I mean, we already, uh, people do that now every minute of the day, people ordering off of major e-tail, or major e-tailers with everything else in their life. Why not just order a part and, uh, for your car and have it shipped to the shop or your house. Yeah, and we had an awful lot of discussion on the podcast about installing customers' parts and oh yeah, <laughs> and how that works and the insurance liability, the um, the warranty liability. It is one major, major can of worms today when, when it comes to the technology side of diagnostics. And we'll continue to have conversations like this. And in fact. God, Chris, it's almost like, uh, you know, maybe I got to get you and a couple of your, uh, you know, Confederates together and maybe have a discussion about this. Um, that would be very exciting. Now, you mentioned the word telematics just a little bit ago. And what, one of the things that I'm surprised about with telematics, Chris, is the low adoption rate that service professionals are having with this. There seems to be more uh, either dongles or, or or smartphone connectivity out there, but I don't see, and, and maybe maybe my I may not have a big enough view of this, and that's why I'm asking you, why aren't there enough shop owners looking for that connection to their customer? I can't really answer that, Calm, as to why they're not. There are so many new, as you said, um, dongle-based applications and tools. If it's for the shop, you would group that under the heading of CRM tools. Most um, forward-thinking shops have CRM tools or software in their shops. Now, some of them have uh, acquired dongles to they give or they sell to their to their fleet. Well, their, their fleet is, of course, all their customers, all their customers' vehicles. A lot of them just aren't forward-thinking enough or they haven't seen the return or they can't, it's, it's not been demonstrated to them the return on their investment for just deploying you know, a fleet of, of dongles for their, for their customers. I was pretty heavy into this about five or six years ago, and um, I, w I am still so surprised today that I don't see the, uh, as I said, the adoption rate. And I, I, I was at Vision this couple, couple of weekends ago, saw a couple of those companies on display there and asked a few questions. And is it possible that the service professional isn't adopting this because that device has a tendency to become a DIY unit instead of a DIFM unit? Well, partially it's true. I mean, if think about the doctors out there that are all bothered by WebMD and then now you can video your a, a doctor somewhere and, and he can prescribe medicine based on what you've discussed with him via video. Although medical, a lot of people in the medical profession don't like that, just like uh, the independent service community 
probably wouldn't like that. Another reason I think, Carm, is that they have low pickup, low, low uptake for, for this is there are literally hundreds and hundreds of providers of this technology. So there is no one system. There is no one way. There is no – and so from, for a fleet – for a shop owner to really take advantage of his, his investment in this, he would really need to get them to all to a thousand or two thousand or five thousand of his customers. Well, what if what if ten uh, percent of them already have one brand, a, a consumer brand they bought at you know they bought at Best Buy, they bought at the local telecom store, whatever, and then another third have this, and another third can't stand technology, and and everybody else is scared of uh, data privacy issues. Well then he can't have his devices can't be across all his whole fleet then. You know, I think you brought up a really good point. First of all, the data privacy. I guess if I was a shop owner and somebody approached me, one of the things that I would want to think about is survivorship. And what I mean by that, Chris, is that it's a, it's an upstart company. You know, they've got five or 600 people adopting this thing and they run out of money. And what happens? Do I, you know, where's the survivorship of the, of the, you know, strong six players in the industry that I could, you know, attach myself to because there are so, so many. <clears throat> I don't want to do this and have it disappear and go away, especially if it becomes a hell of a tactic and a great strategy in my company to connect with my customers at that level. Personally, I think it is a smart tool. I think it should be being adopted more than it is. And I have to go out and figure out why. I'm going to go, I'm going to start a crusade. Maybe you can help me. So look at it, <laughs> look at it from your end for me. Um, what if I fail to ask you about uh, what's going on with AASA and technology? There is one thing that's it is exciting. I'll share with you in just a second. But first, I want to come back to something you just said, Carm, and that is um, there are hundreds and hundreds of these players that are out there, and there's and it is difficult to attach yourself to one type of technology or one system or one dongle or one whatever. But everybody predicts that at some time in the near future, the next two, three, five years, whatever, that while we're the number of these companies are increasing that eventually they're going to merge. They're going to partner. They're going to be bought out by larger traditional parts manufacturers. Some will go out of business. There's no doubt some will go out of business because they can't all have critical mass across our car park in this country. They just can't. And so I think the number of companies offering these type of technologies is going to shrink. Now, when and how much, and how many there will be the result at the end? You know, will there be five or will there be 50 companies? I don't know. So that's, I just want to address that. But um, ASA is, has recognized for two or three years that the type of supplier to this industry is changing. And what I mean by that is we still have the majority of suppliers in this industry provide uh, tools, equipment, chemicals, and hard parts, as we call them, uh, to the independent aftermarket, and we'll continue to do so. But there's a growing need for these companies to learn more about these mobility technologies, these emerging uh, disruptive technologies like predictive analytics and dongles and telematics and such, um, and the ability to convert a hard part to a smart part. So, what we're doing is we're creating a brand new event later this year and a new organization for suppliers of mobility technologies to the aftermarket. There are, there are hundreds, if not thousands of companies that are already trying to do this for, to supply the automakers, to supply OE dealers, to supply, uh, uh, you know, the, the OEMs. But there are hundreds, if not in the thousands of companies that actually are developing aftermarket applications. The difference is they may or may not see themselves as an independent aftermarket supplier, even though they really are. So if they're selling their content, their product or their service or their solution to either one of our retailers, to one of our distributors, to an e-tailer, or even direct to a shop, I would submit even direct to consumers than their supplier to the independent aftermarket because it's content for a vehicle that'll help a motorist that's applied after the car leaves the, the, uh, the dealership. And so we're creating an organization that will 
reach out and meet and address the needs of these types of companies. But even more importantly, we'll provide a form for these companies to be able to create relationships with our current members, those who supply parts, tools, and chemicals and equipment and diagnostics. Smart to do that, Chris. Wow. So you guys are looking ahead. Thank you so much, Chris Gardner, Vice President, Programs and Member Services from AASA, who manages all things technology. And man, did we have a great dose of that today. Oh, we do. There's no shortage of that. And Carm, this was so much fun. I appreciate the opportunity to, to converse with you about technology in our industry. It was a blast. Come back. You name it. Thanks, Be man. back. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks, Chris Gardner, for your review of the Consumer Electronics Show and your view into the future of tech from the view of AASA. You did give us some things to think about. Find Chris Gardner's extended bio and show talking points at remarkableresults.biz slash E315. And thank you for joining us in your support of the Aftermarket's premier podcast. I know you're finding a treasure trove of learning opportunities and wisdom in the podcast archives that include the individual interviews and the Town Hall Academy single subject forums. Thank you for writing me and telling me it's so. And as always, any questions or comments, email me carm at remarkableresults.biz or head over to the contact page on the website. As of this release, there are over 314 audiobook episodes that bring insights and inspiration to all aftermarket professionals. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time, 